Hello everyone, good morning and welcome to this morning's webinar entitled Education 5.0, Artificial Intelligence and Natural Language Processing or NLP in short. Our guest speaker this morning is Mr. Sean Kilachan, who is currently based in New York. He has kindly offered to share with us insights on how AI-assisted proficiency tests are conducted and assessed. This live webinar is brought to you by the English Language Teaching Centre, Ministry of Education Malaysia and EduSync. I am Jess Veer and I am from the Department of Language and Technology and I'm assisted this morning by my colleagues, Mr. Mohamad Hazrul bin Haris Fazila, Dr. Mohamad Faisal Farish bin Isha, Dr. Ramesh Loganadan, Dr. Noor Fazlin bin T. Sajan, Mr. Rosti Harun and Mr. Sufyan bin Otman. Before handing the session over to Sean, uh, please do type in your questions, if you have any, um, in the Q&A section. In addition to this webinar, you will be entitled to an e-certificate. I will walk you through the process at the end of the webinar, so do stay on. With that, I'd like to hand the session over to Sean. Thank you. Okay, thank you Jazir for the introduction. Um, and hello everybody, my name is Sean. I am the co-founder and CEO of EduSync, an online language testing company. And as Jazir said, today I will be taking you through uh, what it is that we do, as well as how artificial intelligence and natural language processing are changing the world of education as we know it. So on that note, I will share my screen and jump right into the presentation. Okay. All right. So I trust everyone is seeing my screen. Um, before I jump into what it is that we do at EduSync, I want to tell a little story about Hannah. So Hannah is the head of English programs at a company named Berlitz. Now Berlitz is the largest language training company on earth with millions of students spread across over 60 countries. And it's a privatized language training outfit with English being their main concern. Now, even before uh, COVID-19 changed the world as we knew it, uh, Berlitz had an interesting series of problems when it came to their assessments, especially of English language. So previously, all their testing was done with a pen and paper or using simple multiple choice testing on a computer. Any kind of exam or assessment where they had to actually evaluate someone's spoken and written ability was done on a video chat or telephone call or even in person. There was no actual centralized tool for Hannah and her staff to use to gather data on their students. And most importantly for their students, there was no way for them to receive feedback unless it was given out individually by Hannah and her team. To address these issues, we actually created a company called EduSync. So EduSync started uh, as an online training and mock testing platform for exams like the IELTS, TOEFL, and TOEIC. So we have both a, a web-based solution as well as a mobile app for Android that you can download from the Google Play Store. We also started conducting general level testing using the Common European Framework of Reference or the CEFR to allow institutions to assess general levels of English both for placement testing, exit testing, and even more recently admissions into universities. And the entire system is unified and gives institutions the ability to read detailed analytics and reports so they can understand where each student 
is, what their strengths and weaknesses are, and how to help them improve. And all this is done in one place. Most recently, we also added in a remote proctoring tool using artificial intelligence. This has become particularly relevant in the post COVID-19 days where most universities now have a very strong online presence, but need to make sure that the person taking the exam that they're administering is the person they say they are. And this is where we, we can help. So what makes us different? Our platform provides online training of all four primary English skills, reading, listening, speaking, and writing. We like to say that we are the Uber of English testing as we have a 1000 person strong network of professors from around the world who will actually receive each spoken and written submission individually and score it. All of the reporting is done within 24 hours and the entire platform was designed to be used at scale globally and also at a very affordable price point. Just to give an idea of how it is that we conduct and showcase the spoken and written components of our platform. So when a student comes on and actually does their test, they'll be able to, oh, hold on one second, make sure. Are you guys seeing my slides now? Yes, Sean. Okay, I think uh, my computer is a little bit slow here. One moment. Okay, is my my screen being shared? Can you guys see my screen well? Okay, I'm going to just keep the screen like this so it's uh, easy to see. So as I was saying, the the real power of what we've built and what I'll be talking about today comes from how to assess spoken and written language, especially English with technology. So we use a system where we have a, a network of professors, but also a layer of uh, technology in between that allows us to process and score any student from around the world who submits an exam across these four specific categories, fluency and coherence, vocab usage, grammar, as well as accent and pronunciation. Just a little bit more about the platform before I dive into the topic of today's uh, conversation. Uh, we currently have over 300,000 registered us users on our platform. We have over 47 institutional partners around the world. There is an EduSync user in every country on earth and over 8 million questions have been answered on the system. And as I'll dive into, every time we have a question that's answered on our system, it actually feeds into the system itself and it helps us learn about each student and helps us improve the platform as a whole. Sean, sure, if I may interrupt. Sure. Uh, there's, there's a question. Um, will writing, will there ever be a possibility of writing being assessed completely by AI? The answer does to that, that is does yes. Does that make sense? Yeah. It does. Okay. Uh, it's a great question. The answer to that is yes, and we're actually surprisingly close already. Um, not EduSync, but uh, you know the technology companies that exist nowadays. Many of them have solutions for assessing writing in a completely automated fashion that allows you to really pinpoint a user's ability. The one challenge that most that most uh, companies are facing is actually to have the context of what is written being analyzed. So, and I've done a number of these AI driven, I used a number of these AI driven tools. Um, this is the big challenge that this whole natural language processing industry 
and technology is helping helping us address. So if you write an essay with perfect grammar, great sentence structure, great organization, but what you're writing about is not actually answering the question, you can still get a very high score on some of these tools. So the key is really being able to understand what is being written and the context they're in. So this is the big challenge that currently faces technology companies nowadays, but I do believe within the next three to five years, we will have maybe even less, we will have something very close to being 100% fully automated. And I'll explain in a, in a few minutes how these tools work and how they actually leverage the use of human beings to power the artificial intelligence, which is what I believe to be the, uh, the way that this will work moving forward. So uh, just moving on here, the a number of our clients that we currently have, um, we have clients from all over the world, from India, Aptech, the English Learning Language Academy in India is one of the largest there, as well as all around Latin America with open English and even education first, um, and even around Asia. So while I'm based in New York, we do have partners in Hong Kong, as well as Australia, New Zealand, uh, even the US you see here with Boston University and Arizona State University. It is more important than ever nowadays that these assessments are conducted online, that they are conducted efficiently, and that they work. And it is interesting to see in the post-COVID world, or in the current COVID world, how these how online testing has really become a very important feature for any kind of educational institution. So just a little bit of background on me and who I am. So I was born and raised in New York City. Um, I actually was living in India uh, and I had, had moved back to New York after uh, passing through the quarantine in India. I'm currently splitting time between Mumbai and New York City. Um, I actually majored in economics and computer science uh, from Brandeis University, a university outside of Boston in the US. Um, I spent seven years living in Latin America, in Brazil, where we actually built EdgeSync up, and uh, I speak English and Portuguese, and I'm working on my Hindi. So uh, EdgeSync was actually created as uh, a way to treat this problem and uh, help us uh, help institutions assess English fluency around the world. So it's not restricted to one region uh, or one country. Now, as I jump into this world of artificial intelligence and natural language processing, I just wanted to touch on this term industry 4.0, which is something that has been thrown around a lot recently. And it's just interesting to see the progression of industry and how it affects education. So, in the 1700s, you had the steam engine, which was the real first innovation, technological innovation to change industry as a whole. The production line came, you know, some hundred years later and really pushed the world into what is called or industry 2.0. It wasn't until the computer came around that industry 3.0 has uh, had really changed the way that companies operate. So a lot of automation was introduced. You can now process large amounts of data and even draw conclusions from it without really needing to do everything by hand. Industry 4.0 is the connecting of these computers and machines and allowing them to communicate, sharing data back and forth, um, which allows industries to process even more data, become more intelligent as companies and evolve uh, at a faster rate. Now, the same progression also happened in the world of education. So with education 1.0 individuals were were trained specifically to get a job and uh, normally menial tasks some kind of manual labor you would learn a very specific skill education 2.0 as things started getting more complex with production lines workers now needed to be able to read and write and communicate amongst each other and really think outside the box and further develop themselves to be able to then help develop the company. As computers became a tool for industry as a whole, 
Education 3.0 brought on computer literacy. So using computers was uh, something that needed to be taught to people at scale so they could then operate them within companies. Education 4.0, which is the phase that we are all currently in, is where the connectivity of these computers actually changes how we need to be learning and even teaching our next generations. One of the biggest issues that the world currently faces is that, and I'm, I'm sure many of you in the space saw this during the last year, where the entire world was forced to go digital and there was a scramble because not everyone was able to use the internet or the computer well enough to actually continue in a meaningful way. The transition from in-person teaching and in-person learning to online teaching and online learning has been smooth for some, has been rocky for others, but this education 4.0 paradigm really is moving the needle for students and teaching them more relevant skills in today's digital landscape. So just to touch on my experience with education 3.0 using technology as a tool. So before I started Edusync, I was part of another initiative called Magnus Gion. And the idea was to actually manufacture tablets, so hardware, from India and bring it to Brazil for educational usage. There's a few interesting statistics about the large volumes of students in both countries, which made Brazil an ideal place for us to launch this project. Now, the idea was to create seven and nine inch tablets. This was in 2013, 2014. We were also embedding educational software. So remember, this Education 3.0 initiative was the was technology being a tool. Um, this was how the tablets were going to change the lives of students around the world. This was our main objective. We were producing Samsung quality devices at a low price and even white labeling them for certain companies. And we were really focused on this educational sector. So at the time, Brazil was taking off uh, in terms of its economy and things were going quite well for the country and a lot of money was being invested in education. And as a country that leapfrogged a lot of traditional technologies that were adopted in the US, um, primarily being desktop computers, the tablet looked to be a perfect fit for the students of, of Brazil. This is just a photo of our CEO uh, with the tablets with an indigenous school in the Amazon rainforest. So as you can imagine, students getting their hands on these devices was a, a game changing a game changing thing for them in that they had never been given access to technology, um, let alone a tablet. And we spent a few weeks actually teaching them, the students, as well as the trainers, the teachers, how to use the devices effectively in the classroom. So this is a perfect example of Education 3.0 in action where the users were leveraging the use of hardware as a tool. Now, that project ended up failing, but from that project came Edusync, which I will be talking about momentarily, but moving into this educational Education 4.0 world, leveraging connectivity. So this is probably a, a sentence that you, may, you guys may have heard but it's one of my, my favorites in terms of depicting the importance of technology in the classroom nowadays. Technology can't replace te teachers, but teachers who use technology will replace teachers who don't. This is something that I think has become mo more relevant in this last year than any anything else, but is really true in terms of being able to leverage different platforms, different types of technology, so that teachers can actually help usher us from this education 2.0 world where most students still are, into this education 4.0 world, where we can use the internet and use the tools at our disposal to really help educate students for the next generation, for the next wave of technology and the next wave of jobs that is gonna come up. And artificial intelligence and natural language processing play a huge piece in this. And I'm gonna to get to that in a second. Just to talk about a few of the effects of this move towards Industry 4.0 and Education 4.0, uh, 
the the idea is really to spend less time doing more activities so you have less waste you have higher growth and higher efficiency you also optimize the use of resources because you're collecting data and you're exchanging information uh, amongst yourselves as well as others from around the world and one of the big things that i think is very important to mention is on the bottom left of this slide this rewarding jobs the the major one of the major impacts of this move towards education 4.0 is the importance of user experience and i'm sure many of you have seen this in your day to day with students over the course of the last year but many solutions that have been built were not really thinking of with the users in mind and understanding now that everything is interwoven and connected it's more important than ever that we as educators understand that students need to be given the tools to actually not only feel good about what they're doing but in, enjoy the experience as well so this is the entire move towards this interconnected education industry 4.0 now some interesting uh, facts here about this merging of industry and education because as we all know the lines now are being blurred more than ever before so historically throughout throughout time and and just in generally in industries around the world um, these points on the left were really what they were focused on and this is how they translate into the educational space so whereas the production line needs to be more flexible we're now focused on adaptive learning or tailor-made learning paths which can be done using artificial intelligence um, quality control um, is very similar or active quality control is very similar to formative testing where we are constantly assessing students to make sure that they are not only grasping concepts but are mastering them at the same time um, the automation that took place throughout the last two waves of this industry tech revolution teachers are now acting more as a capacity of a mentor and showcasing students how they can learn as opposed to just giving them facts about individual occurrences so the teacher really is there as a guide and the technology becomes the tool custom products lead to divergence and pluralism so being able to have specific educational products that cater themselves to the student again this idea of adaptive and custom learning is really the objective sean if i may may ask another question uh, sure. this question says um, how do you see the role of formative assessments inside and outside the classroom as students move to be more digital this is a great question um, i think especially given the the occurrence of what happened last year and is currently still happening with covid i think formative assessment has now become more important than ever and a lot of universities that we work with actually have chosen to remove some of their summative assessments where they may place 30 to 40 percent of a student's grade on one exam they've decided to now remove that exam split it up into six to seven different tests and constantly assess the student as they go through their course um, it proves to be better for the institution because they can guarantee that students are keeping up with the work for the students it's better because their experience is better they don't have to rely on their score from one exam to dictate whether they will move to the next course or not and for just the general experience of both the students and the institutions it makes a lot of sense uh, some interesting and creative solutions we're now seeing are self-creating formative assessments so there are a few artificial intelligence companies that are using ai to basically create tests by itself so as students go through and take you know two three or four exams they will then these companies will then use that data to automatically generate the next exam and use it to actually fill the the knowledge gaps of the students that they showcased in the previous tests so i think formative assessment is a very powerful tool and i think as we get deeper into this online educational space is going to become more and more important and we're going to see it more and more often 
uh, around the world and in different in different parts of the student's education. So I guess that leads well into the last point that's on this slide, which is this uh, lifelong learning where everyone is, you know, you everyone is a student forever. So the idea of, of taking and, and being able to measure that success is all done through formative assessments. So, but the importance of continuously learning and even we as educators uh, must also continue training and bettering ourselves so we can then teach more effectively. So just to define these two terms here, the difference between assessment and evaluation. Um, we focus primarily on assessment at my company, although evaluation is also very important. So as you can see here, assessment is more measuring knowledge or skills or attitudes or beliefs, whereas evaluations are primarily focused on showcasing course content mastery. And oftentimes that comes with just grades. So while we do attempt to focus on assessments, obviously grades are important and the ability for an institution to understand is a student grasping the material allows them to even better the material as they continue forward and improve their own pedagogical practices. So one way that we conduct our standardized assessments using technology is students will log on to our website where they'll take a writing or speaking test. They can also do it on their cell phone. Their responses are then distributed to one of the 1000 certified evaluators we have on our platform. And the you know parts of the test are evaluated using artificial intelligence, but the real the real mixture is what or the mixture of the human and the machine is what gives us this very unique way of doing this. So within 24 hours, one of these certified professors will have reviewed the system and the platform and the exam and given direct feedback to the students um, in combination with the AI level of evaluation that we use. So an interesting use case of this, um, we work with an organization in Indonesia uh, called LIA that has a very widespread student population, 63,000 students spread across 65 centers throughout 18 regions in Indonesia. Before working with them, a lot of their testing processes were still done with pen and paper. And as you can imagine, this was a logistical uh, nightmare. So uh, we started working with them with a focus on our TOEFL, IELTS and TOEIC exams, as well as the general level test. But the real focus here was to help move Leah into this education 4.0 or education 5.0. Uh, which I'll talk about momentarily, um, space where they no longer have to do the evaluations themselves. They're able to administer tests at scale, collect the data automatically, and then using the AI-powered nature of EduSync, they're able, to, they're able to then determine, do they have to change certain items on the exam? Uh, are students actually mastering the material? Are they retaining the material? So there's a lot of interesting uh, aspects here that the technology can really help with. Now, the crux of this whole conversation, education 5.0 and artificial intelligence and how it plays a role in this space. So before I jump in here, just to set the tone, uh, there's a lot of misunderstandings about what artificial intelligence actually is. So when we say artificial intelligence, most people think of the Terminator. AI is coming for our jobs. It is going to change life on this earth as we know it. The interesting thing is that artificial intelligence is actually more like this child in a box here. Uh, AI is already being used by three quarters of every of companies on planet Earth in one way or another, and educational outfits that have been slow to adopt it are now in the process of adopting it in a very significant way. And it really is meant to help us as educators and as, as people. So it's meant to automate tasks that were not previously automated, but do it intelligently and also collect data and give us information that helps us improve our own practices. 
So as a, the pure definition of this, of artificial intelligence, is the simulation of human intelligence in machines that are programmed to think like humans and mimic their actions. So that, and that can be uh, scaled up and expanded greatly. You know, if you have a thousand students taking an assessment, where does AI fit into that place, fit into that process, and how can you use it to leverage, uh, to make sure that students aren't cheating, that they're actually getting tests that are making sure that they're understanding what they're being taught, and then giving us as educators data back that we can use to improve our own practices. So this is one of my favorite uses of artificial intelligence in the classroom. I'm sure many of you have heard of this before. This is computer adaptive testing. Basically, you have a, a large pool of items that have been pre-written, and each item is categorized. And it can get quite complex. So for Edusync, for instance, for our general CEFR placement test, the, the items each have four or five characteristics, from difficulty level to question type and a few other parameters we use that we then feed into uh, this whole system. So as a user is going through and doing their test, they will see different questions based on their own abilities. And the ability to adapt to the user actually not only makes the experience better for them, but allows them to fill knowledge gaps that we might not even know were there, but the system can determine based on uh, how they're actually doing their exams. So the ability to estimate is something that is measured constantly as they're going through the test, um, you know, if they're guessing or not. And as they're going through, the system is processing the data and repeating steps one to three on this slide as the student continues and finishes their test. So they're constantly being fed new questions that are specifically designed to help them and assess them as an individual. Most of the technology behind computer adaptive testing is based on what's called item response theory. So as I mentioned, this idea of setting parameters for each question allows you to then trace the, I guess, the commonalities, the similarities of each question that the student answers correctly or incorrectly, um, or if they're potentially guessing. So there's a lot of interesting potential here with this technology, and this is being used already in a number of different ways, um, primarily for reading and listening testing when it comes to, to English. Um, the key then is to mix this together with natural language processing which then gives you a very individualized way to assess spoken and written English. So some other uses of artificial intelligence in the classroom. This one is also quite interesting, this artificial intelligence led fraud detection. So we also do this at EduSync. We use the webcam, uh, retina tracking of, of the users through the webcam as well as behavioral analysis to determine if a student is probably cheating on their test. So studying thousands of students and processing their information, our artificial intelligence can dictate to a very high level degree of accuracy if a student is likely cheating just based on what they're doing on their computer. Um, we also use some image recognition technology to make sure the student is who they say they are by taking a picture of their ID before the test, um, as well as taking pictures of them throughout the test uh, as they're going through it. Just a little bit more about this adaptive technology, this computer adaptive testing. Um, one of the things that's interesting about this is that you can actually tweak the way the system processes the information based on the exam the student is studying for. So as I mentioned, we typically use this for testing of reading and listening. Now there is a way to also do this for spoken and written testing, where as the student is actually doing their exam, they're also being analyzed. And as they're being analyzed, the computer can then determine, oh, Sean's pronunciation is not great when it comes to the words that end in CH. So for the next question, we're gonna ask him to repeat some words and go through a paragraph that really focuses on these specific skills. So it really does help optimize how students 
are assessed, but also helping them identify their own weaknesses and improve upon them. And then as administrators of the exam, we receive detailed information of each individual learner. You can compare and contrast students as well. So it all becomes much easier to really get a, a better idea of what students are learning or are not learning. And it's all done via this technology. Sean, another question uh, that so, just came in. Uh, this question is how AI tests, how is AI tests different from the traditional tests in terms of uh, speaking tests? I think this, this audience wants to know how is, is it different from uh, the conventional speaking tests? Sure. So again, one of the challenges with with spoken and written testing is the context of what the student is saying. So one of the ways that we're looking to use artificial intelligence for our speaking tests is, you know, on a TOEFL exam, for instance, the student will speak for 45 seconds directly in response to a question. On the IELTS exam, they'll actually conduct an interview, 20 minute interview. There are ways to assess different pieces of spoken proficiency without doing it in either of these formats. So we're actually going to be mixing together something similar to what the TOEFL does, where it's a free spoken 30 to 60 seconds of English. You can then use artificial intelligence to process this audio clip and actually pick out if the user is pronouncing things, pronouncing things correctly, How's their grammar? Uh, how is the rhythm and cadence of their speech? And if it's if it's clear. So there's a number of different ways that, and this is NLP as well, which I'll get to momentarily, that you can you can use to do this. The uh, difference between this and the traditional testing is that traditional testing has not been adaptive. So using technology, using AI specifically, every spoken test that's done on the platform would theoretically be different. So no two users would see the same test. Uh, you know, my pronunciation may be with words that end in CH. I have a difficulty uh, pronouncing them. Whereas my, someone else in my class may have a problem, you know, pronouncing words that start with TH. And so the test itself will understand these differences and feed us questions focused on these issues. So it, allows for a much more individualized testing experience while also allowing for the students to focus on their specific weaknesses. This is something that I think um, most exams historically have not been able to do and something that tech can really help uh, can really help do moving forward. The other thing that's interesting I think is the predictive abilities of this. So based on the results of these exams, one can use artificial intelligence to actually determine the likelihood of the student being able to progress to the next level uh, in a certain amount of time. Uh, I mean, another case study of this is, which I'm going to talk about right now with IBM, is uh, predicting dropout rates. So for an institution, it could be interesting to layer in some technology around uh, around this specifically, and you can you can do it uh, using as many data points as possible, but uh, assessments and scores are certainly something that, that play into this as well. So I think there's a lot more interesting types of testing that are, that's going to come out as well. Formative assessments for spoken and written English where users may just speak a sentence or two into WhatsApp or another uh, messaging application every couple of days and you can have it automatically evaluated and assessed using using artificial intelligence. So as I mentioned, there are a couple other use cases of AI in education, um, personalization and constructive feedback to students I've mentioned a lot, as well as helping us as educators improve our content and methodologies, predictive analytics as well. If a student does, if a student has such fundamental flaws that are showcased on an assessment, what are the what's the likelihood that they're going to drop out of the course or stick with it so these kinds of things are quite powerful and can can be used throughout an, an organization i just mentioned this case study that ibm did 
using AI to help reduce dropouts, dropout rates of students. Um, and they could determine this based on studying previous data of other students who then dropped out and use that to kind of extrapolate forward to see what the likelihood would be of a student with a similar track record or a similar situation, how likely they might be to drop out. Another inter interesting app that uh, or interesting technology that uses AI for the business side of things is this company Genzibar. So they help institutions predict enrollment, uh, boost retention, and even improve financial aid by analyzing tons of data around the students who apply to the school as well as students who are currently in the school and even their careers thereafter. So it's a very creative use of artificial intelligence to really be able to determine the optimal situation for each school. Now onto natural language processing. So just to give a formal definition of what NLP is, it is the interaction between computers and human languages. So specifically natural language processing is how do computers actually process and analyze free form spoken English or free form written English, what we would call natural language, where we interact normally with the machine. How does the machine then interpret that and give us information that we find valuable? So here's an example of how machine learning based written assessment works. Now, this is something I, I mentioned this earlier in the beginning of the conversation or the webinar. This technology is all relatively recent, so there is no silver bullet, as they say. There is not one technology that reigns supreme over others, but they, the major challenge is still analyzing the content of what is written and the context. So as I'm showing here, students will, will write an essay, typically 150 words on their phone or computer, one would then train thousands, tens of thousands of uh, exams. You would feed them into a computer, exams that were graded by human beings already, and pointing out the flaws and grammatical errors here, as well as uh, conjugation errors or punctuation or organization. And the machine learns from the evaluations done by professors. And then it will it uses its own algorithms after you after you train it to evaluate vocab usage or grammatical structures or whatever you're looking to evaluate. So you can actually train a machine to pinpoint the areas that you're looking to assess, and it will then do it for you. When it comes to speaking, it's infinitely more complex. I think the just the nature of speech and of itself and the fact that it's so fluid and can be so different as opposed to writing makes this a lot more challenging. So one of the interesting ways that companies are looking at doing oral, te oral proficiency testing now is what they call elicited imitation. So instead of having a student speak for 45 seconds or a minute straight about a topic or a prompt that they received, you actually can have them repeat specific phrases and using their answers and processing it with artificial intelligence and this NLP technology, determine if they're actually proficient or not. Again, this focuses much more on, this kind of removes the problem of analyzing context in that you give users very specific words and phrases and you can test their pronunciation, their cadence of speech, as well as a few other items. But uh, the big challenge again is to take a block of 45 seconds to a minute, have that analyzed and uh, and actually use that as the assessment. So, but this this way works quite well. It's, it's very effective. Um, we're experimenting with this as well currently and we'll likely be building it into our application soon. But uh, the idea is really uh, written out here. I mean, you start with a survey to 
understand the previous exposure that the user has to the language being tested, in our case, English. You can also then use this technology to, to break down the brain's ability to process language information in pieces. So, and doing it this way allows you, as, us as an educators, us as educators, to get more insight to the students' abilities as well. As they go through the test, it's also what they call computer adaptive. So as they're going through the test, they're able to actually see questions focused on their own individual weaknesses. So no one will see the same test two times. Sean, this, another question. Um, sure. Sorry for, for interrupting, no but uh, this is a very interesting question. Um, the audience has asked this question. Wouldn't digital teaching increase the divide between the haves and the have nots? Not everyone owns a device and some may not have good inter internet connectivity. Wouldn't they be left behind? It's a great question. And this is definitely one of the challenges that I think the world is now facing, much more now than ever before. But there are some very interesting companies that are aiming to fix this. So the initiative that actually started the tablet business that I was a part of was called One Tablet Per Child. It was a government initiative from India to give every student in India, 300 million students, give them all a device. So there's also now with the proliferation of different types of smartphones, there are opportunities to get devices into the hands of people who don't have them. Once the device is in their hands, the ability to access the internet is also a big challenge, right? So there are a few very interesting initiatives started by some of these lo really large tech companies. Um, one is satellite-based internet. So I think it's Elon Musk has a company that is going to be launching constellations of satellites that will be projecting internet 24 hours a day directly down to where from where they are. Um, Google has one as well using balloons where they put a Wi-Fi device on a weather balloon and they can have it stationary over a, a certain region for a certain amount of time. Uh, Facebook also is creating drone based internet that's that's solar powered so these drones will circle the earth continuously projecting wi-fi downwards to whoever is around them so there's a lot of interesting ways that people are working to get through this um you know the the idea is that i i do believe that online education is is definitely going to maybe initially divide things more but it will be the the great uh, the great achiever in terms of its ability to give opportunities to those who have none. I've seen this firsthand in many countries in that I've been in where uh, users who have access to the internet are inherently curious, students are inherently curious, and they use their access to learn skills and drive themselves to be better. So I do think that there's a lot of challenges that need to be addressed and we need to get devices into everybody's hands, but it's just a matter of time. I think um, the internet being the way that it's currently built with so much available information for free is really gonna be a great equalizer as opposed to making the problem even worse, given enough time. Uh, another question, Sean, which is uh, related. Um, Ms. Ng wants you to respond to uh, this. She wants your view. Uh, what's the best in-class commercial ML or AI technology for education? You mentioned a case study for IBM's Watson. How do mm. Google AI, Microsoft Azure, and Amazon AI, uh, AWS, compare to Watson? It's a great question. Um, I don't know that I'm the best one to answer this question, but I'll give my opinion. Um, we, for, for our specific usage with language testing, we found that Watson was the most user-friendly. We also experimented with TensorFlow, which is Google's, and uh, I know that they're improving their technology 
all the time. And that whole deep mind company that they purchased uh, has really pushed them forward in a big way for the NLP side of things. So we've actually been flirting with using um, Google has an has an API where you can actually use it to do natural language processing. So I think it depends on what is what the use case is. If you're going to be building your own customized language exam, maybe best to use uh, if it's going to be a spoken test, you can use Google's speech to text technology and integrate that with TensorFlow and have a kind of AI driven uh, oral test. If you're going to be doing something more specific, like Watson could be very could be used very well for writing assessments. So depending on the the actual use case, I think it might be useful to look at the, look at them differently. So for us, we chose Watson as well because it made sense in terms of the business relationship. Um, we had a, a contact at, at IBM that let us pilot it out and and test out. Uh, the system, they have very friendly APIs as well, so our developers were very happy with it. But um, it really depends on what it is you're trying to accomplish. And for us, since it was language testing, Watson seemed to be the best. We're probably going to be moving to this Google text or speech to text technology in the next six, six months or so that will kind of complement the existing oral proficiency testing we do. So um, I'm happy to send more information on, on that after as well. Um, if uh, if desired, it's a good question. So uh, I guess I'll just continue on here. So um, a company that we came across that uses Google's AI, it's called TerraTalk. So uh, I thought this was an interesting uh, English language learning use case where the students will use this app themselves. It's specifically to practice speech. And the teachers then receive the results and uh, kind of not offline, but they receive them in a way that it's not invasive to the students. And uh, the idea is that it's teacher independent. So the teachers are there to guide, but more in a way that the student requests as opposed to kind of overseeing what they're doing at all times. And then Google's AI, uh, I believe that this app will actually allow the user to navigate their English language learning journey alone. Another example of AI in the classroom that I really liked was this idea of speech robots in the classroom. So uh, I think this was in Japan. I saw that um, this a few schools had adopted these robots that spoke back to students. And one of the interesting things about this was not only were they, you know, embedded with cutting edge natural language processing tech so they could actually understand what the students were saying and respond accordingly, but the students had a much better time speaking to robots than to human beings. So the students became more confident. They got feedback from the robot on pronunciation and uh, grammar and structure and rhythm and cadence, et cetera, et cetera. But it was a very interesting use case in terms of AI being used in a, in a creative and fun way where students actually felt more comfortable speaking with the robots than they did with human human based teachers or human beings. But these again, these are just a few examples that I came across. I think now, especially what's been happening the last six months or so, there's uh, there's more happening in this space than ever before, and we're going to keep seeing increased usage of artificial intelligence in the classroom, whether it's from a language learning perspective or other subjects. And I think the biggest the biggest push is really going to be in the spoken language testing. So as as you all can see, when you get a new smartphone and or you download the new so, uh, software for your smartphone, Alexa and Siri and Google's assistant are all getting very good at understanding accents and exactly what we want to do. So it's only a matter of time before those can be used to analyze context and then put into actual assessments, which is what we are trying to do. So just to wrap up here, Hannah from uh, my initial story, the head of English programs at Berlitz, obviously with a company as large as Berlitz, Technology is something that you'd think that they'd be familiar with, 
Um, unfortunately, as the years went on and the companies got bigger, they were unable to adapt. But with EduSync or with any other kind of uh, AI-based or NLP-based language testing platform, language training platform, I think the world is, uh, is very open. And I do believe that this industry is going to be changing pretty dramatically over the next few years, continuing to improve. And we're just going to see artificial intelligence and NLP technology more interwoven in our lives uh, as time goes on. And that's it. So uh, this is my email, by the way, Sean at If uh, if anyone has any other questions outside of this, feel free to email me, um, and I'd be happy to happy to have a conversation. Uh, thank you, Sean. There are there are a few more questions. Uh, quite interesting. Sure. Uh, um, the first one. If technology and AI mobilities is replacing the work of teaching in assessing pupils' speaking and writing proficiency, then how can the saying teacher, the teacher won't be replaced, as you explained in the previous uh, slide? Um, yes, yeah, so my, my belief in this is that, again, that same line that uh, technology will not replace teachers, but teachers that use technology will, re will replace ones that don't. So the actual testing of the student is something that can be already be done by the platform, by platform or by a software. What's done with the result is really where the teacher comes into play. So being able to assess a student's ability automatically, it will give them feedback and maybe point them in the right direction to where they should go to learn, to improve. But the actual teaching of the of the skills and especially when it comes to spoken English, I think is going to require a human being for the foreseeable future. I don't see that, that part of the educational process being removed, but I do think it can be improved with the data gathered from conducting assessments uh, using technology. So uh, in that sense, you know, I don't I do not believe teachers are getting replaced. It's just a matter of teachers being able to use this technology to make their lives easier. That's really what it what it is currently. Thank you, Sean. There's, there's one more question. Um, sure. Online learning or digital learning provides greater distraction as it needs more self-discipline and self-motivation from the students themselves to monitor to monitor their learning. How do you make sure effective learning from the students through digital learning. How do you make sure effective learning takes place um, through digital learning? Uh, quite a valid this question. Is a very, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. This is a very interesting question and a very difficult question to answer. I do believe that this is going to come. I don't think this has been truly solved yet. I think it's uh, something that's still evolving, but I do see a huge potential for gamification throughout this entire process. Uh, we even thought about doing this with EduSync when a student was preparing for their TOEFL or IELTS exam. And every few questions, you, you know, you give them a reward, uh, something on the platform, some kind of digital uh, token or something that can uh, actually give them the sense of accomplishing their goal and uh, give them enhanced, enhanced incentives to continue doing the work. So, I think both offline and online gamification could be something of interest to look at in terms of how this can be addressed. I know that for younger students, I have a, one of our, one of our partners, uh, a high school in, I want to say, India. Um, the parents actually give the students prizes or treats or some kind of reward if they accomplish the daily goal on EduSync or on their language learning software. So there's some creative ways to really kind of, you know, quote unquote, make sure the student is learning. Um, and I think gamification is definitely one of the more interesting ways to look at this. It's been shown to improve retention and increase uh, cognitive abilities too, because as, you, as your brain gets rewarded, it seeks out more of what rewarded it, which in this case would be more knowledge. So. Um, but yeah, I think this is something again that's going to be. It's going to take some time to figure this one out. I don't know that there is a unified solution. I think we'll see a number of different interesting solutions sprouting up 
uh, all over the world that combine fact, you know, factors of gamification with traditional education and putting it all in a digital format. Thank you, Sean. One last question, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, this is coming from the team. Um, given the impact that COVID-19 has had on the world this last few months, how do you see the how do you see that impacting the role of AI and NLP in schools moving forward? I think COVID accelerated what was already happening. Um, I, I know that just from my personal experience, the the desire to integrate technologies that make teachers' lives easier is now in higher demand than it ever has been historically. That includes technologies that help making testing easier or giving out homework easier or generally giving the students tools to use at home to study with. So I think a lot of these, um, uh, an example of this that I saw, I think this was also in Japan. Uh, one, one professor bought uh, Google voice activated speakers for his students and the homework assignments were always to interact and speak with Google's art AI. So um, the idea being for the student to practice speaking in a way that didn't involve the teacher because the teacher could not conduct the same kind of exercise with 50 students, but gave the student a different experience as well, you know, talking to a robot, so to speak, um, but also allowed the teacher's life to be a bit easier. So I think solutions like this we're going to be seeing more and more and the more the more sophisticated they get the more we're going to see them on our cell phones too i think um something very interesting about the indian landscape is that it's always developed for mobile first there so there's a few companies that are doing uh this a little bit outside the english language world but you can now get a uh, a graduate level degree from your cell phone in India. So the idea that with the cell phone now becoming the main instrument for the majority of people who may not have access to a computer, having tools on the phone specifically focused using or specifically focused on language learning or language testing that leverage the use of AI and NLP is going to be easier than ever before. And we're going to be seeing more and more of it and it's just going to help it's going to help the students, but it's also going to help us as educators. Uh, it's going to help reduce the time we spend evaluating tests. It's going to help feed us data that we didn't even know existed about each student information as well. So I think it's going to become more and more prominent. And, um, you know, as I said, I, I don't think this is even really known by most people, but some 75% of companies in the world use artificial intelligence in some way already. So it's only going to get more widespread. And uh, I'm very excited about the future of this because I do think it can be something great for students, but also great for, for us as educators. Thank you, Sean. Uh, while you were explaining, another question popped up. Uh, sure. I think, I think this, this is a good question. Um, how could AI enabled assessment tool assess students answers fairly and reasonably based on their diverse culture and societal backgrounds? This is a great question. Now, this is one of the problems with, uh, you know, this is why we don't use a full AI driven system because it cannot take into account these kinds of factors. Um, although when it comes to a standardized test, these factors are not necessarily to be taken into account. Um, the general concept being that if you're doing an adaptive exam, your abilities reflect these aspects of your upbringing or your life or your situation, and therefore are reflected in the items you see as the test adapts to you. Um, I don't know if I believe that fully. I do think that it does have some validity to it, um, but this is going to be something interesting to see. I don't know that uh, there's a one way of take, one silver bullet to take care of this. One of the ways that we're doing this is, you know, you can curve the score of the exam based on a survey conducted at the beginning of the test with the student. Now, validating that information, making sure it's all correct and accurate and they're not 
giving us information to help boost their scores is a, a whole other issue. So, but I think there's a way to do this where you combine information gathered by the company or by you or even given by the individual with the actual adaptive nature of the test and doing this enough times, I'm sure there's some relation you could uh, derive that would help you kind of adjust the scores accordingly. But it's a very, very complicated question. I, I don't know that, um, that I have the full answer to that, but I, I do think that we're going to see this more and more over the next couple of years as, you know, the world is now more flat than ever with these digital solutions. Uh, we're going to have to get creative with how, how they work. So um, for admissions testing and such, I know they already are doing this where the test may be fully evaluated by a human, by a, by a computer or a machine, but the actual decision is done by a human being who will look at the demographic data of the student, socioeconomic data of the student, and then use that combined with the test results to determine if they get it or not. Thank you, Sean. That was awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the webinar. On behalf of ELTC, we would like to express our gratitude to Sean for taking the time to share information on AI-assisted assess assessment and how it is carried out without having to leave the comfort of our homes and taken at any time from anywhere. Right, so what makes it even more interesting uh, and our main cause of concern is the uh, security against fraudulence and um, Sean has answered that question. The security is pretty good. It can detect if anyone is trying to cheat. Yeah, okay. So now allow me to walk you through the process of how you can obtain an e-certificate for this webinar. First, you would need to scan the QR code or the link on the poster and it will take you to the improve page. Uh, just a moment, let me share that page with you. Just a side. All right, this is taking a while. Give me a moment. Right, okay. So uh, once you scan the QR code, it will bring you to this page. All you need to do is to scroll down. Sorry, give me a sec. Right, okay. So you can join the live event. Right, what is important is this. You need to uh, first, of course, become a participant, yeah? So that you can uh, participate in the Google Classroom uh, quiz. The video will be uh, there for you to uh, view once again. Now, if you look at delivery, okay, the follow up micro course will be delivered using Google Classroom. In order to access Google Classroom, you and hold. Right, so this will walk you through, uh, this page will walk you through the entire process. And once you're done, yeah, you need to, um, okay, the page is missing, hold on. Just a sec, yeah? I lost the page for a bit. Right, so once you register, you just need to key in into the, um, sorry. This is a mess. Right, um, the class code, you need to look out for the class code. Now, we have opened the registration for both uh, MOE teachers and uh, officers, 
and for international um, participants. So if you have any questions, do drop us an email. It is on the page just below the uh, e-banner. OK, and we will get back to you as soon as possible. So this webinar entitles you to a four hour LPS and this can be recorded on your SPL KPM uh, portal. Please, please do take some time to register on Improve for a range of micro courses offered on this portal. All you need to do is to click on Improve Educator and register with your digital learning email address provided by the Ministry of Education, Malaysia. For non-MOE audience, you may register using your personal email address. And uh, for further information and assistance, do drop us an email provided on the page just below the post poster. We hope that this session has been uh, beneficial for you as it has been for us. Thank you. And once again, take care. Stay safe.